Hello everyone, so this is the Novi Workshop channel. Um, this is the first video I've created this channel with the main goal of sharing some knowledge and also to encourage people to learn more about uh, what I would call like, like intermediate uh, topics in electronics. Just stuff that isn't just the regular Arduino stuff and really learning more about the basics of electronics. So, for this first video, which will probably be um, a mini-series of videos, I've decided to, to build a project that will teach a lot of people about discrete electronics and transistors and stuff like that. So, what we are going to be building is this. It's a little, just headphone amplifier. So, this is my pair of headphones that I use. It's a, it's a Sennheiser, it's a HD650. And the thing is, for the past like six years, yeah, six years, this is what I've used. It's a little, one of those Simoy amplifiers that I've built myself back in 2014, December 9th, 2014. So yeah, it's just a little Simoy amplifier that I've built. It worked great through all these years, and I really can't complain about it. It's 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 perfect. It it does its job well, and yeah. But uh, the negative terminal of the nine volt battery broke off, so I had to replace it. And then I uh, back then I was mostly listening to it on a laptop on a portable environment. I had to move around a lot. But these days I have my workstation and it is a desktop computer, so I don't need the portability of this. So I decided I was going to build um, a desktop headphone amplifier. And I just thought, hey, that's a, that's a really good way to teach people about like analog electronics. So this is what we are going to be building together, okay? So it's a headphone amplifier, it will have to drive a Sennheiser HD650, but it should be also capable of driving regular headphones that are usually like 32 ohms, and also low impedance headphones, because like today there are some 16 ohm headphones, I guess because of like mobile devices and the, there are batteries, so yeah, so people these days have 16 ohm headphones for some reason. Uh, I, won't, I won't say a lot because like I have a headphone of a 300 ohm impedance, so yeah. Uh, it should fit inside a 120 by 97 by 40 millimeter enclosure. It's one of those eBay, like, black aluminium anodized enclosures. Like, uh, it's not here right now. I probably misplaced it somewhere, but yeah. You know what I mean, just those black boxes. Black, like, um, project boxes. It should be powered from a single supply, because I want to put everything inside of it. It's a small enclosure, so I don't want to put, like, two transformers. So, single supply, all contained. It should have a low distortion, less than 0.1% THD. This is literally like, you can't, you can't hear more than, uh, less than this, so like 0.1% distortion is pretty acceptable for this. Um, since it's going to be a, a, a desktop unit, and since it's a headphone amplifier and all that, I want it to be Class A. Class A is really not the, it's the worst in terms of efficiency. Um, that's why you shouldn't be building, for example, oh, you could, but you shouldn't be building like class A power amplifiers. But for a headphone amplifier, it's perfectly acceptable and it's a great learning experience. It should be fully discrete, so no op amps, no ICs. And I want the circuit to be very minimalistic and easy to understand. So uh, we are not going to be building discrete op amps. Maybe in the future, if I decide to build, like for example, a power amplifier, we can go for discrete op amps. Um, the main thing about discrete op amps is that uh, even though they are great, they are amazing. Um, for a beginner, it's very difficult to understand. Okay, so I wouldn't want to be like making a one-hour video like explaining every single detail of, of, of an op amp. Um, so first we can build this and with the basis that we are going to be covering here, we in the future can for example go and uh, with that knowledge be able to build a discrete op amp. So yeah, um, one of the main things that we need to be concerned about in this case is going to be this. So 
what are we seeing here? Let me focus this. Okay, so um, I took some snapshots with my oscilloscope um, of the headphone output um, of my mobile phone. It's just a Galaxy Note 9. So this, so. And it outputs around like one volt peak to peak. Okay, so with that in mind, we're just going to to, to use that as our input voltage for all the other calculations we're going to do along the video. And we also had to have in mind that the old headphone amplifier, this one, the CMY one, when I connected my uh, mobile phone with this output of one, mil of one volt peak to peak, it was giving about like 6.25 uh, volts peak to peak. And that was like really plenty <laughs> on my headphone. It was I couldn't I, I couldn't listen to this for like a minute. And so that's a, a great like 100% volume. I really don't need more than that. So that is already going to put a constraint on our voltage supply. So we can't have a voltage supply that's too low. For example, we can't go with the final circuit that we're that I'm going to be presenting. We can't have, for example, a 10 volt power supply, but we can get by with a 12 volt power supply. But if need be, we can go up to like a 15 volt power supply maximum, but I really want to make just a single supply of 12 volts. And just for reference, here is a line level chart. You can find this on Wikipedia. And you can see that, for example, the zero dBV level for consumer electronics is like 1.4 one four volts peak so that's like 2.8 volts peak to peak so it's double more than double of our standard headphone output so but since we're mostly going to be dealing with like headphone outputs it's going to be the headphone output of a laptop um it's it's not good we don't need to to care about line level unless we if we want to to deal with this then we can probably put some either some attenuation on the headphone amplifier so that when you have a signal like this that it's too hot for the amplifier you can have a gain switch um, or uh, we can also uh, um, uh, target this voltage and since this is just going to be last we just have like more room so yeah so with all of this in mind um, let's go through what we are going to be doing today and what we are going to be learning so this is the full idea from the conception of the idea that we have to the finished product. So this is going to be the steps that we are going to be taking. So first of all, I've divided this into three sections. It's going to be the amplifier design, power supply design, and then we are going to have a finished product. Uh, so first of all, um, we've gone through the specifications and the limitations. Um, the first thing we're going to do next is going to be to look at transistor selection, look at what are our, our, our low power solutions and the medium and high power. Uh, this is just basically going to be the, the simple stuff, just learning like how to read a data sheet, how to choose a transistor for the project. Um, then we are going to actually be going to some circuits. The first one that we are going to be looking at is going to be the emitter follower. It's very commonly used as a buffer. We're going to look at the single transistor topology and we're going to uh, increase its uh, current handling capabilities by looking at Darlington and complementary feedback pair. Uh, we're going to be looking at current sources and sinks and how to design them. Then we're going to be combining what we've learned so far uh, into a single circuit. We have a meter follower with a current sink. Uh, that's eventually going to be the output stage of our headphone amplifier. Then we're actually going to look at amplification. Uh, we're going to serve a basic topology of a common emitter with emitter degeneration so that we at least to start with something that has a bit of feedback and it's a bit more linear because I don't think um, learning about uh, common emitters without emitter degeneration to be a, a good approach right now. Uh, then we're going to uh, be looking into uh, using shunt feedback to basically to, to create a, a kind of like a, a pseudo operational amplifier as people are usually used to it. Uh, then we're going to combine the two. We're going to combine what we've learned with the emitter follower with a common emitter. 
uh, to create a two transistor amplifier with shunt feedback. It's going to operate a lot like an op amp, but a very poor op amp. Uh, and then we're going to start improving the performance using current sinks and current sources. And throughout all of this, I'm going to be showing how to calculate stuff, how to dimension things to really make the, the most optimal design and so that you actually learn what you're doing, not just copying some circuit from the internet and building it. Because then you can adapt it, you can really make it your own and to suit your own needs. Then. We're going to be looking at a bit of power supply design. We're going to have an overview of topologies from ICs to actually like a discrete um, power supply. We're going to learn a lot here. Uh, then we're going to look at transformer selection and unregulated power supply design. This way we're going to be learning um, how to dimension the diodes, which diodes to use, um, capacitors, safety, and stuff like that. And we're actually going to build a regulator we're going to use in this project. I decided to go for shunt regulators since we're just doing class A and just wasting tons of, of power. Then let, let's just go all the way in and, <laughs> and use a shunt regulator. <laughs> also because like this, this uh, amplifier is going to have a very poor coma mode rejection. Um, and po Sorry, it's going to have a... Yeah, also that, but... Uh, so it's going to have very poor power supply rejection, so you need a very stable power supply for this. Um, we're going to be looking like it's just a Zener diode example, then we're going to buffer it, and then we're going to actually going to build a full shunt regulator with a reference and all that. Then, in the end, we're just basically going to have the finished project. Um, we'll be combining the two circuits, making a, a, a PCB for it, um, and then we're going to um, build it all up and take some measurements, measure THD, measure noise, um, everything that we can here in the lab. Now so, yeah. let's look at some transistors, okay? So this is going to be the, the pair of transistors that we're going to be using for all the low power parts of the circuit. This is basically going to be providing uh, amplification and it's going also to be controlling the current sources and sinks. Um, I chose to go with a BC549 and a BC559 uh, NPN and PNP pair, um, mainly because it's readily available here in Europe and also because it's the no noise version of the very common BC547. Um, which makes it a bit better for our application um, taking into consideration that it's a headphone, so any noise can be easily picked up our ear. In that case, it's different from a power amplifier, but in a power amplifier, you should also just, uh, to be safe, use the no noise version, the, the no loise, low noise version. <laughs> oh. um, so, um, this is what I'm going to be using, but you can also use a BC547 if that's what you've got, no problem. Um, in the Americas, it's very common to use the 2N3904 or the 2N2222. Um, I don't know uh, the low noise versions of those transistors offhand, so just Google it a bit and you're probably going to find something. But let's begin. Like When you're selecting a transistor for your next project, um, you have to take into consideration a couple of things. First of all, think about your supply voltage. In this case we're going to have a single supply of 15 volts. Um, if you had a split supply of 15 volts you gotta be mindful of that. That's going to be like 30 volts and stuff like that. In this case just going to be 15 volts. Um, the transistor we're going to be using is plenty capable. It's a 30 volt rated device from collector to emitter. Even if we had a short to ground on the emitter and the full supply voltage on the collector, it will be completely safe. Um, if you were going to be using, for example, a split supply at 30 volts, uh, you should go to the 45 or the 65 versions. Um, don't just because it, it says it can take 30 volts, you use the 30 volt version. Uh, the other thing that we are going to be mindful of is how much current we are going to be drawing from this. Uh, in this case, it can go up to like 100 milliamps, which is 
way too much for such a small device. Uh, we're not going to be taking them nowhere near these values. Uh, it's probably just going to be like a couple of milliamps, like one, two, maybe five milliamps for the, the power supply sides of things. Um, so this is going to be uh, like good enough. Uh, next thing that we are going to be looking at, uh, we have here the base emitter voltage. So our base emitter drops typically going to be um, 660 millivolts. So that's what the value that we're going to be using our cal calculations later. Um, we don't have to to look at, at the, the gain bandwidth because we're never going to be nowhere near these values. You're going to be like in the audio range, not in the RF range. So, but if you're going to be designing something more RF-y, then you, you should probably take into account that. Um, another thing that's going to be very important, um, it's going to be the HFE, the, the gain, the current gain of the device. Um, the bigger this is, the better, especially since this is going to be uh, uh, taking like some very low, um, some very low voltage signals and amplifying them quite a bit. So this is just going to be, since we're going to be using feedback, it's not like a huge deal. But uh, this can help uh, bring the input impedance of the amplifier up a bit. So just be mindful of that. It's going to be like around 100 and 200. So this is a fairly typical transistor. So I think everyone knows quite well these values. Um, next up, we got a pair of BD135 and BD136. So these are going to be our output devices for the headphone amplifier. This is what we're going to be using. Since we don't need to, we're not going to be wasting a lot of power and these are plenty capable and they are small. These are not like the TO220 packages. Um, these are like the TO126, they are smaller. So it's, it's always better, we're not going to be wasting um, much power on them. Uh, again, things to look at, the um, collector emitter voltage in this case it's like 80 volts we are very good in that aspect we are using it at a very low voltage oh sorry it's the 45 volt version that we're going to be using the BD135 and 136 sorry um, next stop we need to be looking at the collector current so as you can see 1.5 amps we are not going to be uh, dumping 1.5 amps into this, so we're going to be dumping way, way less. Uh, it's going to be around uh, like 60, 80 milliamps per channel. W remember that everything here is just going to be doubled because we have two channels. Um, so we are very good in that aspect as well. Let me see what else. Uh, we also need to look at the base emitter voltage. So going to be like maximum of one volt but we are sure going to get less than this um oh in the future we're also going to be looking at the collector emitter saturation and, and all that but don't worry about that right now um and the hfe since this is more of a power device it's in my case it's the the 10 classification so it's going to be like around 63 to 160 uh this is fairly acceptable it's very good for a power device but it's not great um, it sure it's a lot it's a lot better than what we're going to be looking right now so through all these we're going to be looking at the venerable tip 31 and tip 32 that are used everywhere um, these are going to be the device that we're going to be using in the power supply just for ruggedness for like the output stage of the amplifier, we can get by with the TO126 package stuff. Um, but for power supply, since it's going to be taking both channels and it's going to be a shunt power supply, so it will have the full current through it all the time, um, it's better to use something that's a little bit more rugged. And this is what we are going to be using. Uh, so this is going to be plenty for our application. Again, things that we have to look, it's going to be a Tip 31, 40 volt supply, it's okay. We're just going to be using 
Um, for example, if we are going to have uh, a 12 volt supply, it will probably have unregulated around 15 to 20 volts, so it's plenty there. Um, second thing that we need to look at, the current, in this case the collector currents around 3 amps, no need to worry about that, even like let's say that each channel is going to be taking like 100 milliamps, it's not going to, but if it did, we are looking at 200 milliamps, plenty for this device, like this is a bit overkill, but it's, it's just better, this is just so cheap, uh, you might as well just use it, and it's readily available. I think it's more available than the BDU-135, so yeah. Uh, and I think it's also cheaper than the BDU-135, but it's okay. Um, next up here, we need to take a look at the current gain. It's very, like, this is atrocious, it's like 25, but it's fairly common for this type of device, this class. That's why we're going to be using the BD-135 in the output and not this. And yeah, just the, the base emitter, it's like 1.38, 1.8, a lot higher, but that's it. Not Nothing special, nothing weird. Those are going to be the devices that we're going to be using the power supply. Those were all the devices we're going to be using the whole project. Uh, we're also going to be using, like, for example, Zener dial and like that, but we're only looking at transistors. When we get to the power supply, we may look into that. Um, these are going to come back. We, when we are doing the calculations for stuff, we are going to be using these data sheets to help us. So let's start doing some circuitry.